if you all could come today. Um, Damian Chapman, who's uh, assistant professor um, at SOMAS, is going to be talking about um, the shark conservation research that he and his group has been doing. And many of you are um, aware of this, but I'm just saying this for the new students and, and all. Um, so Damian um, started out in New Zealand. Is that where you're born to? Wellington? Okay, yes, that's right. Oh gosh, a Kiwi. Um, <laughs> and he got his bachelor's degree from uh, Victoria University of Wellington. And then he did a master's degree and a subsequent uh, PhD at uh, Nova Southeastern University in Florida. So presumably somewhere between 1995 and 2003 you migrated, immigrated. Bahamas, Florida. Yeah. OK. Um, and he has been here at SOMA since 2008 and oh. nine. <laughs> <laughs> well, the December. Yes, Your appointment sure. started in December of 2008, so okay. Um, <laughs> with no further ado, and I apologize for leaving, but I'm in the middle of a defense here. Um, David is going to all right. talk to you. So everyone can hear all right? So I have an ear infection on this side, so I can't hear at all. So let me know if it's all right. And I can't, that means I can't answer questions from this side of the room. <laughs> And I popped a breath mint before this, but obviously there's something going on here. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, some of the uh, research on uh, shark biology that my research group and collaborators have been doing for the last few years. And we think it's uh, uh, going to be uh, quite informative for uh, uh, ongoing shark conservation efforts around the world. And uh, in terms of shark conservation, um, this material right here is why we need shark conservation. Uh, there's, this material right here is called the serrata tritia. This is actually an x-ray of a shark first dorsal fin that uh, uh, Bob did for me. And this material right here, the serrata tritia, is the main ingredient in the Asian delicacy shark fin soup, um, uh, which fetches upwards of 100 uh, US dollars a bowl. And when the Chinese economy really started to grow in the 1980s, uh, the, 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 the demand for this soup really grew as well. And fishing nations all over the world that had previously been ignoring sharks started really targeting them, targeting them for their fins. And as a result of the very uh, slow reproductive life history of sharks, we've seen all over the world massive declines in shark populations. So it really is a global environmental problem. Now when we think about sharks, we oftentimes thinking of them think of them as really highly migratory species that move really, really long distances, sort of panmictic over broad regional areas. And that really uh, shapes how shark management, uh, or anyway, emerging shark management ha has been practiced. We do regional stock assessments. We take uh, one or a few time series from one or two locations and then extrapolate them for sort of whole big areas. And what I'm going to be arguing today is that there's a few facets of the movement ecology of sharks that argues that we should also be investing in local monitoring, local uh, assessment, and, and local management as well. And those behaviors uh, that I'm going to be talking about, one is site fidelity, which is defined as the occupation of a relatively small area for a, for a long period of time. And the other behavior I'm going to be talking about is natal phylopatry, which is the return of an individual to its own birthplace to reproduce. And you probably, you know about natal phylopatry from sea turtles, from salmonic fish. Um, it's never been directly demonstrated in, in sharks, but I'm gonna be talking about uh, that behavior. And I'm gonna be talking about studies I've done on, on two species. Uh, this is the Caribbean reef shark, Carcharhinus perezi. And this is the uh, lemon shark, Negaprion brevirostris. So they're both tropical species. And the reason I study these, I could give you a long-winded, they're great models for this. I really just like to work in warm environments. Um, and if I can't get a pina colada at the end of the day, I'm not very happy. So this is the Caribbean reef shark, Carcharhinus perezi. Uh, this is a species that's endemic to the Western Atlantic, but it has a life history that's very emblematic for a certain subset of sharks that we call reef sharks. 
And reef sharks are sharks that complete their entire life cycle within the coral reef environment. They, so in other words, this is an adult Caribbean reef shark. There's probably newborns not too far away in the same environment. Um, so they're the really important apex predators in coral reef ecosystems. But because they complete their life cycle within a coral reef ecosystem, we suspect there's no reason for them to move that much. So we, uh, we hypothesize that reef sharks, in this case the Caribbean reef shark, would exhibit high site fidelity, which means they occupy a certain reef for long periods of time. So the place that we have looked at this question is Glover's Reef Atoll, which is off the coast of Belize. Many of you in this room have been here because I uh, teach a summer class at uh, Glover's Reef. So Glover's Reef is one of only four atolls in the Caribbean, and it's just about uh, 25 miles offshore of the Belize Barrier Reef, which is the, the largest barrier reef in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and I was meaning to say all of this uh, material is being published in a paper um, that uh, my student Mark Bond is the lead author on. So I'm going to be talking about a couple aspects of that paper. Um, the first is looking at site fidelity using these things. This is not a torpedo. This is an um, a underwater receiver. And these underwater receivers we anchored all over uh, Glover's Reef in, in these locations. We had about 25 of them for this study. And you, I didn't actually show a picture of it, but this study is based on putting transmitters actually inside the body of sharks that we catch. So we, we catch them, we roll them over, we make a small incision, we put the transmitter in and sew them back up, and then we release them back in the environment. The way, the way that, that this technology actually works, some of you are probably familiar with it, this is Glover's Reef. That red dot right there is a receiver, so it's moored underwater um, with rope and a, and a, and a uh, cinder block and a small float. And that receiver, if it picks up a signal from the transmitter, it records the date and the time. And it, it can detect transmitters typically from around 500 meters away. So if our transmitted shark moves into the detection range, you'll, you'll get a signal, it'll record the ID of the tag, the date and the time. It'll continue to do that. It, it puts the transmitter, the transmitter puts out a signal every 90 seconds. It'll keep doing that. Once the shark moves out, it stops recording signals. So we actually had all 25 receivers around Glover's Reef, and we would go periodically and download them and then see which sharks had been swimming by. Um, I should point out we didn't have very good coverage because these things cost about $1,000, with 25 of them significant investment. With 25, we were able to monitor around about 6% of, of the reef. Um, so our hypothesis is this, that this particular species exhibits site fidelity. And the prediction was if we put a bunch of transmitters in these sharks, send them on their way, we would hear from them regularly on these receivers. That's a pretty simple prediction. So I'm going to show a figure from the paper, and I'm just going to explain what it, what it means by this sort of grab from it. So what you're looking at here, the numbers on the left side will be a transmitter number, and that equals an individual shark with that transmitter. These transmitters last for 12 to 18 months. Um, Obviously along the top, you probably guessed that's calendar month. And basically, if there's a square there, it tells us that shark was detected on any receiver in our array during that month. And if it was detected for more than 14 days out of that month, uh, it's black, sort of uh, going down like that. If there's no square, we did not detect that shark during that particular month. So remember, with 6% coverage of the atoll, a pattern like this, where we're hearing from it you know, every other day, basically, is pretty good evidence that it's hanging around, regularly running into one of these receivers. Um, so this is the sort of pattern that indicates uh, site fidelity for at least uh, a year. So this is all the sharks we, we uh, put transmitters in. This is a mix of uh, juveniles from about this big all the way to adult males and adult females. And what should really pop out is that by and large, most of them we're detecting every single month. There's no big pattern of emigration from the atoll in return. There's definitely some gaps. Some of those gaps are, more, are most likely going to be mortality, and some of those gaps could be sharks moving away from the atoll, but they could just be sharks that are not using part of the atoll that we're monitoring. But overall, the pattern was most of these sharks we were detecting on a regular basis. And some of these ones I can tell you from looking over these files, we were hearing from them every day. Yes, just for the ones where you don't see them till like May, 
had they all been tagged before the study period started or were they caught like for the first time? So yeah, so that's a good question. A lot of, most of them are caught in May and this is from May to the next May, all right? Oh, okay. um, if there's a T, means that one was actually tagged in that month and it went all the way to there. And then this one right here is exactly what you described. That was tagged there. It was tracked all the way until there and this is where the study actually ended and we no longer had receivers. So there's definitely some of the gaps can be explained by uh, gap at the end of the study and so on and so forth. But overall we were, we were uh, pretty happy that look, these animals are showing quite a high degree of site fidelity, uh, meeting, meeting the, the hypothesis. So then as a second part of this paper, we say all right, well if they're, if they're spending lots of time on the reef, you have a lot of animals showing a lot of site fidelity, then perhaps each reef will have its own sort of local structures, local, its own population dynamics. And if we were to go do an experiment and we would remove sharks from the reef, we could just remove sharks from the reef, well, you would see any place you did that, they wouldn't be replenished by reef sharks coming in because each reef has its own sort of separate group of, of sharks. Now that's an experiment which, you know, going out and killing a bunch of sharks, I probably can't get an IACOC for. Uh, I haven't tried. But uh, unfortunately, Belize is one of many countries with an active shark fishery, so they're sort of doing that for us because they have a system of marine reserves where there's no fishing, and then they have a system, they have a lot of places where there's a, a huge amount of shark fishing going on. So we, we predicted that on the unprotected reefs, there would be low shark abundance because they've been uh, fished out essentially if they do have these local population dynamics. So um, again, this is from Mark's paper. This is Mark uh, with the uh, sampling tool. I should point out this is not normal. He's not normally actually there um, <laughs> while this is going on. But this is what we call a baited remote underwater video or a bruv. Um, Carl Safina gave them the name chum cam, which I think is a, a lot better than bruv. Um, basically, in this housing right here is just your run-of-the-mill underwater video, uh, sorry, video camera, handheld video camera. And there's a, uh, uh, you know, you, you can actually see through that port right there. That is a little uh, bait cage filled with one kg of sardines. And uh, basically, we, we set this thing down on the bottom. It records for 70 minutes. I always get that wrong, is that right? 70 85. Minutes. 85. He should know, he watches all this stuff. Um, 85 minutes, we put it so that the current's going this way. So anything that swims up and is caught in the field of view and uh, Mark and his small army of undergraduate volunteers watch these videos and they record presence or absence. Is, do we see any Caribbean reef sharks or do we see no Caribbean reef sharks? If they see two at once, we call that a two. So it's zero, one, or two. If they see three at once, we call it a, a three. We don't make assumptions about sharks seen at different times in the video because it could be the same one coming back unless there's a very obvious size differential, all right? So Mike has loads of these videos, and I don't want to give spoiler alerts for his dissertation defense. I'm not going to show any of these videos. Um, but our study sites were, again, Glover's Reef, uh, another marine reserve, and two fish sites. And th this is what we found. Um, so the, these bars represent, out of 50 bruv deployments at each site, so there's 200 total, how many of them uh, actually had a Caribbean reef shark on it? That's the, uh, that, so in other words, there, out of 16, sorry, out of 50 videos uh, or deployments, there were, there were 16 with Caribbean reef sharks at this site. And actually six of those had, had two that we, we saw at, at the same time. Um, so those are the reserves. And the fish reefs, very obvious decline. We, we hardly ever saw Caribbean reef sharks uh, at the uh, fish sites. Um, and we put that, uh, these data plus all of the environmentals that, uh, and habitat features that Mike measured in the field into a general linear model and the only thing that came out as being a significant effect on shark abundance was whether or not there was fishing. So fishing had a big negative effect on the presence or absence of sharks. So obviously we're pretty, th this pair of studies indicated to us, alright, these sharks have a high degree of site fidelity, they, st they stay in one place. There's evidence of local population dynamics on different reefs, which means these local conservation measures that these people uh, in Belize have put, put together, these marine reserves, are actually seem to be uh, providing a benefit uh, for this particular species. 
So this is, this is very good for a species like the Caribbean reef shark that completes its life cycle, has high site fidelity on a reef. And as I said, this, is, this species is a good model for a lot of these reef sharks that you have in the Indo-Pacific and other places. So we think that species with that sort of life history, you definitely have to think about local processes and local conservation. Uh, but what about the sharks that don't just stay in one place, that use multiple habitats throughout their life and, and move quite a bit? I mean, that, you know, a marine reserve's not going to help that much, but, um, not in, on its own, because of course they're going to move out of the marine reserve over time. So again, this is the lemon shark, Negaprion brerirostris. It's another, uh, it's quite closely related to the uh, Caribbean reef. And it has a life history that's more typical of most large coastal sharks. And that is they have discrete places where they give birth, and those are called nursery areas. For lemon sharks, the nursery area uh, will typically be a sort of a, a, a lagoon, an estuary, shallow water with mangroves, seagrass, something like that. And that's where the newborns, which are about this big, um, spend the first roughly two to three years of their life. And they, they really don't go anyplace else. They just live in that, in, in the place where they were born. Once they get a little bigger, when they're between the ages of 3 and 10 to 12, they occupy a lot of different habitats. They, they move around, we think they move around a bit more, uh, but we don't know if they just sort of move out of the nursery and reside in the surrounding waters, or whether they then become extremely mobile and move all over the place. So it's estimated that they mature somewhere between 10 and 12. Um, we, we're going to revise that with some data that I'm going to show you a little bit later. Um, but once they're adults, we know they move a lot. And the females we know come back to a, to a particular nursery on a regular basis. In fact, they give birth every two to three years to litters of anywhere from four uh, to 20 offspring. Um, what we don't know is these females that are coming back on a regular basis, whether this is the place where they were born like salmon and sea turtles, and that's one of our questions. So this is the island of Bimini, and this is where I actually spent those gap years that Josie was talking about. Um, so Bimini, I'm going to just highlight what we know, uh, you know, take that theoretical life cycle and show you what we know from this site, Bimini. Bimini is on the uh, western edge of the uh, Great Bahama Bank, and some of you have been there, um, uh, Bob and Josie and uh, Brian, and Henry and I took uh, some RU students there one year. Um, and Bimini is a nursery area for lemon sharks. So this area right here is called North Sound uh, and Sharkland. That's uh, quite a big nursery area. That's sort of the major one. This is Bonefish Hole, which is another place where you find a lot of newborn lemon sharks. And this right here is South Bimini, uh, where uh, it's another place where you see juvenile lemon sharks. I colored that one in red because anyone who went on that trip knows that I got bitten by a baby lemon shark while showing people uh, how to actually hold a lemon shark. Um, so I colored it in red. Um, so these little juvenile lemon sharks, they basically work up and down the mangroves. Uh, and they stay in about a meter of water. They really, they really don't go out of a meter of water because if they do, they get eaten. Um, they get eaten by their largest, uh, what we call subadult lemon sharks. So these ones are a bit older, and they're quite a bit bigger, and they've moved into deeper water, and they're waiting outside. And if one of those little ones goes out, they get nailed pretty quick. They're real big cannibals. As far as adults in Bimini, we almost never see adults. Um, the only time we see adults, it's really mainly females, is during the spring months when they come into the lagoon to give birth. And that's when we see newborn sharks. We know sharks are newborn because they actually have an umbilical uh, opening where the, the placental connection is. So we can tell that the shark was just born. They actually have a belly button. So this is uh, actually all the captures for 20 years of adults. And it's not a high number considering how much effort we expend in this area. So they sort of just come in and then they go, the, the adults. So our hypothesis, um, uh, we've done a few studies on this, and the, the first hypothesis we really wanted to test was those larger juveniles, those subadult sharks that we see around Bimini, are they all born there? Or are they from other places? So in other words, do they stay around the, the nursery where they were born until they hit maturity and then start moving around? Or 
do they disperse as soon as they leave the nursery and start hopping around other islands? That was our question. So our but, you know, pretty obvious prediction that if we went out and caught lemon shark, these bigger lemon sharks around Bimini, that those ones, a lot of the ones we would catch, would have been born there. And that raises a big question. How can you tell where a shark that you've never, where can you tell where a shark was born? And we're able to do that because of an extreme amount of field work that we've done, very extreme field work for a very long time. Um, so again, this is the map of Bimini. This nursery right here is sort of where most of the juveniles are. And in this area, we've been setting, every year since 1995, gill nets along the shore. And we catch baby lemon sharks in these gill nets. We check them every 15 minutes so they don't die. And we put them in a central holding pen. And we fish every night 12 hours for basically three weeks. It's a really, uh, it's a major, major deal. Um, so we try to fish until we start really not catching anymore. So we assume we've caught a, a large percentage of, of the animals in there. So um, we started in the spring of 1995. Um, and given the season, I thought just to show, so you can get a sense of the time, this is good. So we started, Bill Clinton was pregnant. Pregnant? <laughs> I don't think he was pregnant. He was president. <laughs> And we catch these little lemon sharks and we put pit tags inside their bodies. Pit tag is a little rice grain sized tag. It's injected under the first dorsal fin. We can actually scan it and it, it reads a number off. So it's a, it's a completely, well, relatively um, non-invasive way to tag them. We also take DNA samples. We measure them. We look and see if they have that uh, umbilical opening so we know their birth year. And we, you know, we, we get a good number of them. So we started in spring 1995. I should say, uh, myself and Dr. Kevin Feldheim, who's visiting, he, we were here the first, the first year, and a lot of this early work was the subject of his PhD. And there's some great photos from there. When we started, my hair looked like something out of a boy band, and his haircut <laughs> made him look like Lou Ferrigno. And I think you're going to show that in your talk this afternoon, that <laughs> picture. Um, but anyway, so Bill Clinton's pregnant, uh, president. <laughs> All right, good, good. Yeah. Things got a bit bad. All right. Uh, hope and change. We're fishing, we're fishing, we're fishing. Then by the end of it, we've caught, um, by, by 2010, it's not finished, still, still going. So if we keep flashing forward, we'll see who the president was. But I didn't put that in. Um, so by 2010, we've, got, we've actually caught nearly 2,000 juvenile sharks. Um, I only got bit once. You only got bit once. Mike, you never got bit. All right, so a lot, of, a lot of these little sharks with, with, with pit tags. So remember, our idea is that the, the large immature sharks living around Bimini, they are born there. So from all our tagging efforts in the mid-1990s, we go out there today, if that's true, we should see a lot of sharks with these pit tags, right? So they should have pit tags. But there's a couple of caveats. Yeah, they should have a pit tag, but that's a long time to hold a pit tag. Some of those tags are going to come out, some of them are going to break. The other thing is, is I did show you that we don't sample the entire nursery. So some sharks are going to escape our clutches. So sometimes we're going to catch sharks, they're not going to have pit tags because uh, they were born there and they're not going to have pit tags because we missed them or their tags broke. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, we're going to use genetics to deal with that. We're going to use a technique called microsatellite DNA profiling. So microsatellites are short, tandemly repeated DNA sequences that we all have in our genomes. All eukaryotes have these sequences. So this is a microsatellite right here. So it's this repeated CA, 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 repeated over and over. It doesn't code for anything. They call it junk DNA. I'm going to talk about how we analyze microsatellites by talking about a pair of hypothetical sharks and look at this hypothetical microsatellite in these sharks. So sharks are like us. They're sexually reproducing diploid animals. So they get one copy of every chromosome from mum and one from dad. So they get two copies of every microsatellite. All right? So you see, on this chromosome, shark number one has a microsatellite that has five tandem repeats. Uh, on this chromosome, it has a microsatellite, the same microsatellite, but instead of five repeats, it actually has seven repeats. All right? So we call these alternate forms of the same microsatellite different alleles. So when I say alleles, all I'm meaning is that there's a difference in the number of repeats in the microsatellite. 
all right? When they have two different alleles, we call them heterozygotes, or they're heterozygous. Um, shark number two has two copies of the same allele, and we call that individual homozygous. So basic, basic genetics, uh, hopefully we understand those terms. So the way we analyze this is that we use polymerase chain reaction, PCR, to make many, many copies within each individual of this microsatellite, all right? And we actually load the product from that reaction into the uh, capillaries of an automated DNA sequencer. And in those capillaries are a polymer, and what we do is we actually apply an electric current. So the DNA will migrate through that polymer, and the rate of travel um, is, go, is proportional to the size. So the smaller the DNA molecule, the faster it goes through the uh, polymer. And during the PCR, we actually incorporate a fluorescent dye into the, 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 uh, the alleles that are being generated through PCR. And what happens is at a, at a fixed point in the machine, there's a laser that's being pushed through. And there's a fluorescence detector on the other side. So when a product comes through, uh, the laser hits it, it fluoresces, and the machine detects it as a, as a you see a peak of fluorescence. And the, the first peak, that, the, the smallest allele, which is this one, which is only five base pairs, that one goes through first, makes a peak. Then this one, which is larger, goes through, makes a peak. All right? So we can actually score different individuals for different alleles because all of, the, all of the, each allele will have a peak at a different point uh, in, in time. All right, so just so you can visualize how it works, so that's shark number one, that's shark number two, we put them through, that allele comes through first, so we get, for the heterozygous individual, we get two peaks, one for the small allele, one for the big. For the homozygous, has two copies of the same allele, we just get the one peak, all right? So how do we use these things to figure out our, our problems with our study? Well, the first, the shed tag problem, would, in essence, we need to know that an animal that didn't, doesn't have a pit tag, that we haven't caught it before and, and the tags just broke, all right? What we do have from that animal is a DNA sample and its profile at multiple microsatellite loci. In fact, we've used 11 different microsatellites and what we have found is that each individual has a unique fingerprint, um, which means a unique combination of alleles. And the probability of two individuals having the same uh, uh, the, the same probability, so the, the same uh, combination of alleles, is really, really small. So, in other words, if it doesn't have a pit tag, we then take its genetic tag, its genetic profile, and if it matches another one in the database, we know it was that shark. So it's a, it's a fail safe for the pit tags. So how, the, the problem of how do you deal with individuals that we never caught is a bit more, is a bit trickier. But the way these microsatellites are inherited, that helps us out a lot. Because again, remember, as I told you, you get one from mom and one from dad. So if, if the, this mom and dad produce uh, three pups, they'll get one allele from mom and one from dad. And if you look across all of the markers we use, individuals that are full siblings should, will share about 50% of their alleles. And statistically, that's very unlikely from any other group other than their actually full siblings. Right? So how does that help us? That helps us, let's say those three sharks I was talking about uh, are living in Bimini in the nursery and two of them get caught but one of them does not. That one grows up but then we catch him. We read him, he doesn't have a pit tag, so how do we know he's born in Bimini? Well, we have his DNA and we can say with confidence that those two are his full siblings. All right? Once we know if they're full siblings, we know he, he was born in that, in that in Bimini. So, so that's how we do it, those, those three things. Pit tag, genetic tag, and is he related to two or more individuals that we, we, have, we have caught? So between 2003 and 2007, we caught 150 of these larger immature lemon sharks around Bimini. Uh, in the field, with a pit tag read, we found that, oh sorry, they were ranging from 90 to 232 centimeters, so quite a wide uh, variation in size, which means they were anywhere from three to 11 years old at the time of capture. So 38 of them right off the bat had a pit tag, and we could trace them back to being, being born at, at on site. Another seven, uh, their genetic tag matched 
uh, one that we had caught before. So we know that, that, that it actually shed its pit tag. So that one's uh, definitely born there as well. And then 33 more had two or more litter mates that we had sampled. So we knew all up that uh, 77 out of 150 had been born at Bimini. So that's quite a high, you know, I mean, as far as a majority, that's a slip of almost the smallest majority you can have. Um, so I'm going to tell you now that our hypothesis wasn't quite right. Our hypothesis was they stay at Bimini until maturity. So what I'm going to show you now is what all the guys in the room don't want to hear. And that is size matters. <laughs> so this is the size of those 150 sharks um, that we caught. And the, the black portions of the bars represent animals we knew were born in Bimini from all these methods. And the white means they were not born in Bimini. They were born someplace else. So what you should be able to see pretty clearly is that most of them are born at Bimini when you're looking at these smaller size classes, which, which uh, goes to about age five to seven. Uh, but after that, you tend to have a much higher percentage. You have a much higher percentage of uh, sharks from other places coming in. And what we think happens is that they, stay, they stick around for a few years and they gradually start to disperse and hop to other islands. And that's really what's going on. And that makes a lot of sense because they're getting bigger, they're looking for more food, they're less vulnerable to predators, so they're going to start moving around. And, and as I said, the adults move around quite a bit. So this is the transition to adulthood as they start to, to move around quite a bit. So the, 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 the last hypothesis of the study is that, that I'm going to talk about today is that the adult females return to their birthplace to breed. So they're, they're now they're during the sub-adult phase, they're moving around. Do these adults, the females, then come back to Bimini to uh, give birth? So our first prediction of that hypothesis would be any DNA that we look at that's maternally inherited, I inherited through the mother, we would see differentiation between different nursery areas. If this was going on generation after generation, these females coming back, that maternally inherited DNA would be structured with different nursery areas. So the mitochondrial, uh, the, the mitochondria that we have in our cells has its own genome. And that sequence that you get comes strictly from the mother. Dad has nothing to do with it. So this is the ideal tool, the sequence of the mitochondrial DNA the ideal tool to test this hypothesis uh, and test this prediction of the hypothesis. So in our lab and many other labs around the world, we have looked at mitochondrial DNA in sharks. Uh, what we've, but we've typically looked at it at really big spatial scales. So Martin Benavides was a student of mine uh, who graduated a couple of years ago, and he actually looked at two species of sharks that are related to reef sharks and lemon sharks. And what he found was that mitochondrial sequences uh, that are common in the Atlantic are absent in the Pacific and, and vice versa. So on a very big scale, there's differentiation. Um, many studies, including one I've done on scalloped hammerheads, have shown the mitochondrial sequences being different on a regional scale by areas separated by a thousand kilometers or more. So the sequences that are very common here in the US are quite uncommon in Central America, about 3,000 kilometers away but then they're, they're nearly absent in Brazil, which is like 7,000 kilometers away. So these studies are good, but they don't look at the, they're not really addressing the question at the scale that we're interested in. And really nobody goes in and looks at the small spatial scales we're talking about. So to look at the small uh, scale, the, the local structure in mitochondrial DNA, we, we, we sampled lemon sharks in, in five different places that are all within about a 300 to 400 kilometer radius of Bimini. All right, so a very small spatial scale. Each one, this, this is the sample size of individuals. These are all juveniles from nursery areas. And we also include one site, the Virgin Islands, that's quite distant. It's about 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers from this site. Uh, this paper's uh, uh, in revision uh, right now. Actually, the revision just sent in. So here are the pie graphs of mitochondrial sequences from these sites. And what we find is that Bimini is differentiated from all of these sites except for one. So a really high degree, and, and the, I won't show the statistics uh, behind it, but these frequencies are, are statistically very uh, significant uh, and a very surprising 
really, uh, because nobody's ever found this on this small spatial scale with sharks, to see such strong structure over a small spatial scale is, is really unprecedented. Um, but this is definitely consistent with the idea that females are coming back to the place they were born, and that's how you get these differences in these sequences between sites. Definitely consistent with our hypothesis, but there's other explanations for it as well. And those explanations could be maybe there's barriers to dispersal between those sites that the female lemon shark never crosses. So it's not that she's coming back, it's just they, they can't get across, they, they, can't, they can't move between sites. The other is that maybe they just don't move that much, they don't move that far. So we can, um, I'm going to show you some data very quickly that sort of rules out those two hypotheses. So these are our study sites uh, right here with the red triangles. And we actually did a study of um, tracking the lemon sharks uh, using that same receiver transmitter technology uh, along the US Eastern Seaboard. And actually we tagged about 50 adult lemon sharks right here in Jupiter. We found uh, 25 of them were detected on receivers at Cape Canaveral, Florida, which is around 250 kilometers away. And we found uh, 15, I think it was about 15, traveled all the way up as far as South Carolina, which is more than 750 kilometers away. So these big adults are capable of moving hundreds of kilometers. So the fact that our sites are only separated by as little as 116 kilometers suggests it's not that they just don't move those distances. What, what about deep water as a barrier? Well, we've tagged several uh, animals in Bimini with external tags, and a, very, a small number have been recaptured by fishermen. And they've been recaptured at, on the east coast of Florida, in the Florida Keys, and in the Panhandle. So they have no problem crossing the Gulf Stream in deep open water if they need to. So this tells us that this pattern we're seeing is more likely to be due to natal phylopatry as opposed to barriers or uh, limited dispersal in the species. But really, at the end of the day, the genetics is very indirect. What we want is direct evidence that they come back. And the prediction, the, the direct evidence would be provided is if we can catch pregnant females coming back to Bimini, and we've got a pit tag in them, so we know they, they, came, they came back, right? That's very direct evidence. So the so that's really the last part of the thing I'm going to be talking about here. So the only problem with, with testing that hypothesis is you have to wait 15 years or so for your data to come back. So um, quite, quite a long way to come back. The other thing is, is you know, you're probably thinking, man, you guys tagged a lot of sharks, so there's going to be a lot of adults that have pit tags. Well, if you do a life table analysis using the mortality rates that we know from Bimini and, and mortality rates from, from other sites, you actually come up with all the sharks that we tag only about 10, somewhere between 10 and 32 are going to survive to give birth to their first litter. And that's assuming no fishing mortality at all, that's natural mortality. And Bimini on the Bahama Bank is a very small island. And I went into GIS, GIS map of the whole thing and figured out how much habitat is there for these females to give birth in. And Bimini represents about 2.4% of the available habitat. So this is the needle and this is the haystack. So we're looking for a needle in a haystack. So if we find it at all, I think it's pretty significant. So of course, the first method we have is go out and catch adult female, so show she's pregnant, and we use a pit tag and we see she was born in Bimini. Very difficult to do, catch these adult females. We, as I said, in 20 years, we've, we've caught maybe 40. Um, so, so not easy. The other way to do it is to take juveniles that we've, we've, we've we've caught and uh, sit, use the genetics to prove that a female that we caught in the 90s was their parent. So an indirect but still very strong way to do it. So we have some cases. So, so I've got something to talk about here. Um, in May 2008 we made a pretty big effort to go out and catch females that were coming in to give birth. We caught two that were newly mature. Uh, one, this one was 243 centimeters. It looks like Mark Bond caught that by hand, um, but uh, I don't think he caught it by hand. Um, in any event, we re uh, read that female and she had a pit tag um, that we had applied um, in 1997 when she was a newborn. All right. So uh, they did an ultrasound, there was a National Geographic film shoot there, and they did an ultrasound 
and there was evidence that she had just given birth. She had a very flaccid uh, uteri indicating that pups had been in there. So that one we are quite confident gave birth at Bimini uh, and was born at Bimini. So case number one. Case number two, a few days later, we actually caught another female. Again, she was about 245 centimeters. Again, newly mature. Um, she had been caught in 1995, but she was born in 1993. She was two years old in 1995. So uh, quite a long time has gone by, 15 years before she's produced her first litter, as far as we can tell. So that, that's why I was saying the maturity, I think, is a bit higher than we think. Um, she was gravid when we caught her. You could feel the pups squirming around inside. They took pictures with the ultrasound. Not only that, um, in June when we did the study with the gillnets and things, we actually caught one of her offspring, genetically tied it to her. So we know she gave birth there for sure. So, all right, in 2009 and 10, uh, we didn't catch pregnant females. We actually didn't try to catch pregnant females because there's only actually somewhere between 10 and 30 females each year that come and give birth. We're worried that running around the lagoon and catching these females might freak them out. They might not come back to give birth. So we stopped doing that because we got these two cases. Um, but in June 2010, we actually went out, did the study again with the gillnets, caught some juveniles, and we found four juveniles, newborns, um, that actually statistically were, were, were definitely uh, the, the progeny of a female that we caught in 1995. And at the time, again, like the other one, she was actually two at the time of capture. So she was actually born in 1993. Again, this is another one that, that, that took quite a long time to mature, much longer than, than, than we thought. So those are our three cases. We have three cases so far. Uh, we did the math. It's, it's, it's very unlikely we would catch those females if they were just randomly using nursery habitat. Um, but we're going to continue. I'll talk about that in a minute. So the conclusion for this study really is, is that this is the first evidence of natal phylopatry, like you see in sea turtles and salmon. This is the first evidence of it occurring in sharks. And we contend that that pattern, that behavior, is causing local population structure on a, on a scale that we've never seen in, in sharks before. We're recommending that people look with these genetic techniques to see if they find structure in other species. Um, we also show with the other study that um, young sharks leave the nursery, um, but then they might linger in that habitat for, or in that general area for quite some time before then dispersing prior to maturity. So the overarching conclusion from both studies is that we think that local management, local monitoring and local assessment is definitely valid for these species and probably others that have a, very, that, that have a similar life history pattern. So we think that assessments and, mon and, mo and monitoring efforts must take this local population structure of these large sharks into account and also take into account the spatial distribution of fishing pressure. Overall, we think that local and domestic policy and things like marine protected areas might actually benefit some of these large sharks. So it's an investment that certain countries uh, should, should really go down. And that, that's really the message when, when I'm not in the field or in, the, in, in my office one of the things I've been doing is traveling around the world, telling people, policymakers, giving them this information. Because these people don't read papers. You've got to go tell them that these sharks, these reef sharks, stay on the reef. And these sharks, they might leave, but they come back to give birth. So this, this is a local, a local deal. So things that you do within your country can actually help conserve them. Right? So this is me actually meeting the, the princess of Fiji, um, talking about shark conservation. Can't see it, but I'm actually in a skirt there. Um, um, this, I'm, I'm much more comfortable in a skirt than I am in a suit right here. This is meeting the uh, cabinet of the Bahamas, and we were spreading a similar message to them. The Bahamas actually, as a result of this campaign, banned shark fishing throughout their whole EEZ. So that's a massive area. I'm trying to get Fiji to do the same in several other countries. But this message that, look, things that you do in your country can benefit a lot of these shark species that have phytopatry or, or site fidelity, I, it's, it's sinking in. So the, the future directions for some of this, this work, um, first, we're, we're keeping going. We're keeping the gill nets going. We're keeping doing this. We want to find out if natal phytopatry is really common. Uh, and I think we're on the verge, the cusp of being able to figure that out because a lot of the females that we've tagged are only just reaching maturity now. 
So it'll be very interesting to see what happens there. I'm really become interested in do is there phylopatry or any kind of site fidelity in big pelagic sharks? So I was talking about a reef shark, then a coastal shark. What about those sharks that live in the open ocean? Do they ever come back to the same place? Or are they just true wanderers that are moving around? And I won't spoil it, but if you want to see some beginning of an answer to that question, I'm doing a talk in Southampton on November 2nd. So you can come see on this species, very cool, the oceanic white tip uh, shark. And lastly, uh, one of the really interesting things that's come out of this is the fact that um, since, you, since these reef sharks, for example, are uh, being overfished on a very you know, local level, it sets up a great experiment to, to, to figure out what are the local ecological impacts of shark removal? How does this change the ecosystem when the sharks are removed? And we are actually continuing research in these two sites right here, looking at different prey of sharks and how they might respond to the, the absence of, of their major predator. Um, and with that, I'm quite happy to stop talking. I'd just like to thank my, um, all of my collaborators, uh, the, the students in my lab, who, you know, quite a, few, quite a number of people have put into this research, and it's, it's been a lot of, lot of fun doing it. And of course, thank the, uh, the funding agencies. And with that, I'm very happy to take questions. Oh, Josie's gone, so I guess I have to pick it. <laughs> we'll go back to front. How did you know that uh, the juveniles you were talking about in this case, those were the first ones that you might have? Did you know how could you say that those were the first ones that you might have first? Oh, sorry, I really can't hear. What sorry. she's asking about is, how do you know that these were the very first pups this female ever had? Oh, because we sample enough of the nurse. Well, okay, to be fair, we, we, we can't be sure. They might have gone to some other place. That is, that is true. They might have gone to another place and given birth. So they might have, um, but the pattern that we've seen at Bimini by reconstructing, uh, it's complicated, but the, the pattern we've seen is that females come back to the same place over and over again. The females in Bimini come back over and over. We don't know, the, in the first years of the study, we didn't know if they were born at Bimini or not. So the females tend to come back to the same nursery. So you're right, we don't know absolutely, but the pattern is that females come back. So we're assuming that the first nursery they come to, uh, that they come back to, is the one they'll keep coming back to. Mike? So the problem is, is that we, um, we don't monitor any other locations like this. So we can't do the sorts of direct, uh, you know, direct uh, comparison. We can't uh, figure out. Well, what I can tell you is one of the sites, the Marquesas Keys, that we did sample, we sampled for multiple years. And we know none of the Bimini females have ever gone to Marquesas to, to pup, and vice versa. Now we know from that none of the, it, to get the level of structure that we observed, is very, it was very high, and it, it, it does preclude the possibility that females really ever um, mix between those and breed, in, breed in that area. It's, it's a very high degree of structure. However, I didn't mention that there's no evidence of structure when you look at the microsatellites, which means the males actually do move around quite a bit and, and uh, uh, spread their genes, as it were. And we know that directly from, is that funny? Is that stupid or something? Um, <laughs> um, what we do know from, oh boy, yeah, good, good. Uh, what we do know is that the males, uh, males almost never give, uh, 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 have offspring in Bimini more than once. It's a handful of cases that a, a male has bred in Bimini more than once. So we also have direct evidence that the males don't, uh, really come back to the same place to breed. 
So they're connected by males, not so much through females. Mary. And uh, we, we, we were in Cape Cod last summer, and they're having a, the, the, the what, great white shark are, sharks are coming back more and more because the sea population is rebounding. And there was something in the paper about them tagging, having tagged in the previous year. Does that mean that the, these individual sharks are coming back to be in the New England area in the, in the summer, or is that just sort of accidental? Yeah, that's another kind of phylopatry, phylopatry to a feeding site. And there's definite evidence in that particular case, the same animals are coming back to Cape Cod over and over again. They actually migrate down to Florida um, for the winter time, and then they come up to the, the summertime to Cape Cod. Uh, but there's definite evidence of white sharks in other places coming back to the same coastal location to feed off on a regular basis as well. So we think phylopatry can be to the place to give birth. Phylopatry can be to a place to feed. Um, what it's, it's never been demonstrated in the, the birthing thing hasn't been demonstrated just because only we're crazy enough to do an experiment like that. I mean, if the, uh, if the natal phylopatry, you know, like becomes established, you know, like uh, knowledge, is there already people asking how the hell do they do that? What is the, the mechanism, the physiological? How, how what, do they do what, it? What senses do they employ to do that? So I can give you a set. There's actually studies done in Vimini. Actually, when those lost years when I was not in school, I was bombing around in Vimini. And one of the things, one of the things we did was we took these newborn lemon sharks, put a transmitter in them, and then we went three miles offshore and dropped them. And they've never been there before, never ever been there before, to see if they could home back. And they could always home back. We dropped one. So we actually were dropping them on the bank. and. Then they put me in charge for one deployment, and I said, right, we're going to put it in the Gulf Stream. So we went and put it in the Gulf Stream. It, um, funnily enough, a lemon shark is pretty much just a particle that just goes up the Gulf Stream. For about, it went up the Gulf Stream for 12 miles, but it slowly got pushed back onto the bank, and it ended up 12 miles away from Bimini. And as soon as it hit the bank, it turned right around and headed straight back to Bimini. And it was a real happy story until a shark ate him on the way in. <laughs> but he did make it back, but one of his siblings ate him on the way in. Another question, uh, two actually. So one is, uh, you showed those two islands where these um, young uh, juveniles are hanging around. And I noticed that both of them are on the south shore of each island, right? So the red and the blue. Yeah. Just, is there something uh, characteristic about the place? Is this like, you know, what is... There is more mangroves. Okay. There's, there's the other coast doesn't have as, uh, that's where the mangroves are. Okay. But I wonder if there's something in there. Do mangroves tend to grow on the south side of the island? I have no idea. And the other question is, how do you age these sharks? Like, uh, is it just um, by the observation uh, and then you do the math, or? Yes. So some of them, if we know their birth year, we know their age. Right. Right. Uh, others, you can't really infer it from from size because they have quite variable growth rates. So, um, so most of the time we're, in, we're sort of inferring an age range. They, they've done the age and growth data by killing sharks and they've, they, they, they actually tag them, inject them with oxytetracycline and it actually forms a ring in their vertebral column, growth ring. And then they catch them at some later date, figure out how many growth rings, and then they, take, they look at growth rings and a whole bunch of individuals and figure out age and growth. But the, um, Kevin and I think the age, the age of maturity is all wrong. Uh, we think it's much, uh, it's, it's at least a few years later than what they estimated because they didn't uh, examine many adults in that study. So how did they come up with these numbers in the first place? Um, well, I think what they did is they aged, they figured out size at age, and then they said we looked at a bunch that were about this size and they were mature, so therefore size at, size, size at maturity is this. But I, I'm quite sure the number of animals they examined that were mature was really small, and I think it's probably quite variable. So they might have just had ones that were, um, you know, sort of early ages, uh, early mature, as opposed to sort of the, the, the more average. Glenn? Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the uh, Belize study, and where you had the no fish areas and the, and the fished areas. And so that was evidence that the sharks are not moving from one area to the other, which I think is perfectly reasonable. But to what extent 
is continued fishing in the fish area, uh, but possible explanation for not finding them there. Uh, so in other words, they, they, when they move in, they get wiped out immediately. Yeah, I didn't really think of that too much. Um, I, I doubt it's that much fishing pressure, uh, to, to be completely honest. Um, there were receivers at other places uh, during this study. We only had one record of one going from one reef to another. But yeah, we should maybe consider that a bit more. Wonder how much you'd have to have a pretty high exploitation rate to have that that pattern. But it's worth a look. The other thing we're quite interested in is is it it could also be that there's just more fish on the first reef. So they become residential once they hit that reef. And if they move to another reef that's fish, they don't like it that much. Um, we're gonna look into that. Um, I tend to think it, I'm starting to think it's not true because Mike's done some stable isotope work with reef sharks and it looks like they feed at a pretty low trophic level and the sorts of fish they might eat are actually things that are quite healthy, you know, reasonably healthy. Uh, but again, I don't want to spoil our alert for his thesis. But that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering, I don't, I'm not that familiar, but do these females have multiple partners in a given pupping? Like, yes. So how does that complexity that these females have pups that are from different males play into kind of teasing out the story? So um, basically, I think it's 86% of the time, a litter has multiple fathers. Um, anywhere, I think the most is three? Five. Five, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so um, so some of the litter are half sips related through the mother, so we can still detect that pretty easily, um, and the others are full sips, right? So you might be thinking of the part of the study where we were saying they have to be full sips, with um, uh, you know that we said they have to be full sips to be born at Bimini. We did that just on the off. We said half sips they're probably going to be from the same litter, but. It could be one male mating with two females. It's not, it doesn't happen that much from what we, we, we detect, but just to be conservative, we, set, we kept it to, the, to that. But the, the markers we have are really very good, and you can tell half sib from full sib quite easily. What's, what's the gestation period? And is there some sort of uh, local area where there's only mating takes place? So the gestation period is uh, believed to be nine months, which is, you know, long, as any woman in the audience can tell you <laughs> who's been pregnant. Um, sharks, the maximum for sharks is actually 18 months, and that's the spiny dogfish. Um, so the, as far as mating goes, we really don't know where mating happens. Um, we've caught a very small number of females that look like they've just recently been uh, made it, and we know because the males bite the female, and you'll see, you know, sort of raw bleeding bite wounds on them. I think there's maybe three or four cases of that in 20 years of Bimini that we've seen a female that looks like that. And males, we very rarely catch males around Bimini, mature males, um, and even though we fish in areas that are deep and, and that we catch big tiger sharks. You know, it's not that it's not good habitat for big sharks. So that I would love to know where the mating area for these things are. Can I just add a comment to this? It's interesting. I recently learned that um, actually Barbara Block um, has put in a proposal and got some funding for setting up uh, some receivers, which are like a satellite. And so she has been also tagging not just tuna, but sharks in you know different regions. And so that might be one way of getting at that issue of tagging them with the sort of things that can be just picked up by a satellite. Yeah, now we've actually tried that with mm -hmm. lemon sharks, adult lemon sharks in Bimini, um, and they actually, they eat those tags for breakfast. We don't know what they do, but they destroy them. <laughs> they, they, uh, we think they like, they, they're bottom oriented shark, we think they go, what is that? And they go like that and they smash it. Um, we've had the worst success of satellite tagging studies. And those things are five grand a pop, and you just cry when they don't come back. <laughs> we, we had one out of about 10 come back. And the only reason that one came back is we set it for a six week deployment. And um, the other thing is those tags, when they come off and trans transmit to the satellite, they, they float. And 
if you've got an animal that lives near islands, it's going to float in shore real quick. Once it's out of the water, the antenna is not in a good position, doesn't it? And then you don't get any signal back. All good? Oh. Are there species with really distinct breeding grounds like this that no. don't have site fidelity? So there's lots of sharks that have discrete nursery areas, and the short answer is we don't, most of them we don't know. This lemon shark is sort of our, our model, because we can, we can do this, we can catch you know, a large percentage of them. And I'm hopeful that other people will look at the study and try to figure it out for their sake. Yeah. All right.